test pro baby test propionates 10 times cheaper to produce and relabel as DHB. Vigor Steve here, and now we're finally going to figure out whether dihydroboldenone is worth it or not. And we're also going to discuss dihydrotestosterone and whether that's worth taking through its various administration routes. I wanted to group both 5L reduced versions together because they do have some overlapping effects, judging by anecdotal experience from people in the bodybuilding community. Dihydroboldenone is the 5L reduced version of boldenone, equipoise, and obviously DHT is a 5L reduced version of testosterone. I believe that about 2.7 to 3% of the boldenone that you administer gets converted into dihydroboldenone. And with exogenous testosterone, it seems that it converts into dihydrotestosterone at a little bit higher rate, about 5 to 10%. So there is something to say for taking both of these compounds exogenously. They do have their unique characteristics. But if you suffer from hair loss, stay clear, guys. It's definitely not worth it because dihydrotestosterone derivatives, whether that's dihydroboldenone, masterone, primabol, and anivar winstrol, and pure DHT, none of those are going to be hair safe. All of that aside, let's jump into DHB and whether that's worth taking or not. And before we do, please like the video, leave a comment for the algorithm, and consider subscribing if you haven't already. Hit the notification bell button while you're at it, so you can get notified whenever a new video drops. <sighs> let's get started. All right, is DHB worth taking or not? It highly depends on the individual. When dihydroboldenone first became available through the underground labs, Everybody, literally everybody out there that was using it, suffered from terrible post-injection pain. And whether that's something to do with the raws not being produced properly, or the underground labs doing something wrong in the brewing process, not having so much experience with DHB cypionate, again, it's a reasonably new compound, and everybody still needs to get some experience with it regarding the brewing process. In the beginning when this compound came out, everybody had severe post-injection pain. A lot of people were not willing to experiment it with it further, but the people that persisted and the underground labs that continued refining the brewing process of DHB cypionate figured it out a couple of years later. And now supposedly there's some DHB cypionate out there that is reasonably pain-free with tolerable post-injection pain or um, what they're saying, no post-injection pain at all, assuming that it's brewed at a lower concentration of less than 100 milligrams for one milliliter. And again, I could be mistaken, guys. I'm not really into home brewing. There's plenty of other guys like Chase Irons out there who are very experienced with home brewing. I'm just going from the anecdotal reports that I've read online and the people that I've talked to. The people that have good experience with DHB cypionate, they stick with brews or brew themselves at a concentration of 75 milligrams up to 100 milligrams for one milliliter. And they advised me and all of the people that they work with to stay clear of DHB cypionate formulations upwards of 200 milligrams per one milliliter. A higher concentration, generally speaking, means more post-injection pain when it comes to DHB, which is certainly interesting because through 5-alpha reduction and changing the ester from undesalinate to cypionate, the concentration really has to go down to mitigate the post-injection pain. So instead of a 300 milligrams, 400 milligrams, or 500 milligrams per one milliliter boldenone and desalinate formula, resulting in very little post-injection pain. I mean, there's very little anecdotal evidence that even higher concentrations of boldenone result in severe post-injection pain. Whereas a dihydroboldenone with a cypionate ester, 75 milligrams, 100 milligrams per one milliliter is tolerable, and anything upwards of that, post-injection pain in a bottle. Now, from the people that do like their DHB at a lower concentration and resulting in a higher injection volume, they swear by it. Again, it's the same as with Stenbolone or Mint, Trestolone. People that like DHB, just like with Stenbolone or Mint, if you like it, you keep taking it. It might be a suitable replacement for Primabolin or Masterone or get something in the middle of Primo, Masterone and Testosterone or comparable to Stenbolone, which again, we're going by anecdotal evidence and the anecdotal reports are spaced far few between with Stenbolone. So people that like it, they really like DHB, and people that tried it didn't like it due to the post-injection pain or because they didn't get good results, not the result that they expected. 
they run one experiment with the compound and never use it again. So it's hit and miss, it seems. The evidence for liver toxicity is there. Again, that's on a rodent study, so you have to keep that into consideration. With boldenone, there's evidence that it's kidney toxic, and with dihydroboldenone, there's evidence, both in rodent models, that it's liver toxic. Now, for me personally, understanding these risks and the potential for organ stress, I would say that further experimentation with boldenone is not going to be worth it, because again, I have prima boldenone at my disposal. Now, don't get me wrong, I've used boldenone in the past and I've gotten great results. At that time, boldenone was worth it to me, either because prima boldenone was not available, or I was afraid that the prima boldenone that was available was fake or underdosed, counterfeited, or the pharmaceutical prima boldenone that was available was too expensive, right? And then boldenone was a suitable replacement. Now, that was way before dihydroboldenone became available. Knowing everything that I know now, being financially secure and having prima boldenone available to me, I would choose prima boldenone any day of the week. That being said, there are people out there who prefer to replace prima boldenone with dihydroboldenone because they get comparable results. And they also feel that dihydroboldenone and some of its metabolites offer better aromatized enzyme inhibition compared to prima bolin or mastron for that matter, all at comparable dosages. Some guys even say that DHB reduced their serum estradiol levels by half, switching from boldenone or prima bolin to dihydroboldenone. So there is something to say for DHB in the context of a contest prep. Usually guys that use DHB CPNA during a contest prep say that they're way rounder, way fuller, way more vascular compared to boldenone or prima boldenone, and that's why they prefer it. Their strength is better. Again, this is all anecdotal evidence. And honestly, guys, let me interject here a little bit. Going by those kinds of reports where people say that DHB is the shit, or mint is the shit, or standalone is the shit during a contest prep. From my personal experience coaching a decent amount of athletes during their contest prep, it's probably test probe. Why? Because test probe aromatizes into estradiol to a certain extent. And even if you're using a decent amount of aromatized inhibitors, if you have a testosterone base, if that's testosterone probe and you add more testosterone probe on top, you're going to be full, round, and dense. And you're expecting a decent amount of aromatized enzyme inhibition from DHB or maybe standalone for that matter. And of course, meant would potentiate a decent amount of additional aromatized enzyme activity promoting the conversion of testosterone into estradiol. For the guys that say that they're round and hard and a lot of glycogen retention after adding a compound XYZ in, well, since it's the underground lab scene, it's probably test probe. Test probe gives you fullness <laughs> during a contest prep. And of course, some of the other compounds are able to do that as well, but those don't convert into estradiol. So if you're experiencing a decent amount of fullness suddenly by adding DHB in, and you're running that at a concentration of 300 milligrams per one milliliter and you don't get any post-injection pain, test pro, baby. Test propionate 10 times cheaper to produce and relabel as DHB. Right, so keep that in mind. Some of the anecdotal reports are very out there and describe DHB or the other compounds that we discussed in this video series as the best thing, the next compound the ultimate steroid during your contest prep, but it could just be test probe, and those guys were probably overdoing their aromatized inhibitors, right? So keep that in mind. Still, there's something to say for DHB. It might be worth of an experiment similar to standalone or mint. Personally, I have no interest in running DHB because I have Prima Ballon as an alternative. And honestly, knowing Trin and understanding how Trin works, even at very low dosages of 50 milligrams per week or 100 milligrams per week, I would rather subject myself to the potential for anger management issues that Trembolone has because, again, the anecdotal evidence of Trembolone and the scientific literature is far more extensive than DHB. And I would rather go that direction than experiment with another compound that doesn't have so much scientific literature behind it that only ended up in pro-hormone supplements, was never FDA approved as an actual injectable. Again, it's only available through the underground labs. Um, so that being said, I would say that dihydroboldenone is not worth it. Again, I don't have any personal experience with it. So I'm just purely going by the reports that I've read online and understanding the pharmacodynamics of boldenone itself and all of the alternatives that we have at our disposal. 
I would say that dihydrobaldenone is not worth it, not worth the potential for post-injection pain, but that's just my personal opinion, not based on any personal experience. That being said, whenever I look for information about boldenone or dihydrobaldenone on YouTube, on the message boards, wherever else, talking to people that have used both compounds currently and in the past, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of DHB supporters out there. And of course, in this context, the majority wins. So don't listen to me. DHB has its place. The people who love it really love it. They put it in all of their cycles, whether that's during the off season or contest prep, a little bit of test, plenty of DHB cypionate on top. They get great results. They post their blood work. I don't see any anecdotal evidence on their blood work for severe liver stress. Again, you, they might be using oral steroids and training insane increasing their liver enzymes to a certain extent. Gamma GT levels are in range. And the only thing of note that I see is that estradiol levels are slightly lower compared to comparable dosages of primabolin or mastrone or boldenone, compounds which are known to inhibit the conversion of testosterone into estradiol. So again, there might be some practical application for DHB worthy of an experiment. Just keep in mind, if this experiment is a success, you might end up like all of the other DHB supporters and never, ever excluding it from your future cycles. And with that verdict out of the way, let's move over to the last injectable anabolic androgenic steroid, which we're going to discuss in this injectables worth it or not a video series being injectable dihydrotestosterone, which happens to be completely bioidentical. So there's two bioidentical compounds which you can inject testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. Now is injectable DHT worth it or not? Again, if you suffer from hair loss, stay clear. If you need to use a 5 alpha reductase inhibitor when you're using exogenous testosterone, you definitely don't want to use DHT in an injectable format. There's two different products on the market, which I can't seem to locate anywhere. It's not on anybody's product list. I've literally scoured all over the internet for androstenolone enethate brand name Anaboline Depot, and I've also looked for Androstenolone Propionate, brand name Pesomax. Can't find it anywhere, but there are a decent amount of anecdotal reports of people using either of these pharmaceuticals and getting phenomenal results. Again, the people that have tried it, all of the limited amount of anecdotal reports that I've read about injectable DHT with either the enethate or propionate ester attached, Man, people praise it like it's none other. People say it's the missing link. Their libido is phenomenal. Their hair loss is manageable or completely worth it. All of the results, all of the anabolism that they get are not comparable to anything else. Prima Bolin, forget about it. Dihydrobaldenone, forget about it. Stenbolone, forget about it. Trimbolone comes close, but with injectable DHT enantate propionate, the aggression is more manageable, so it might be more worth it then trimbolone acetate, enantate, or parabolin, trimbolone hexahydro benzyl carbonate. That being said, it seems to be unobtainable for the large majority of us. The only raw powders that I've found were DHT by itself without an enantate or propionate ester attached. And that only seems to be good for a DHT suspension. I can't find any anecdotal reports about DHT suspension. Some people have mentioned it but they said they didn't want to try it. They didn't want to homebrew their own DHT suspension. So I can't find any anecdotal reports about DHT suspension. The only reports I found were about DHT with an ester. People really love that shit. But again, I can't find any source that carries it. Understanding the pharmacodynamics of DHT, understanding that it's bioidentical, understanding that during puberty, it might grow your penis. And at later stages in life, People try to use DHT suspension in the form of undertame cream, which I can't find anywhere also. So people result into compound their own DHT cream. The people who compound their own, rub it on their penis before bed, claim to get good results. Now, personally, I would really like to try that. But going by what little is available through the underground lab scene, honestly, guys, I would prefer to compound my own DHT cream and figure out for the sake of the community if a self-compounded DHT cream is able to grow my penis overnight. So stay tuned. Hopefully, maybe at one point or another, after I've gotten an email back from 
Red Raccoon Powders. That's an alias, by the way. Um, maybe I'll be able to run that experiment. So let's leave it there. If you have any experience with DHT cream to grow your penis, let us know down below in the comment section. I would love to hear your anecdotal reports. You know what? Let me give you guys the protocol of what I would do if I ever get my hands on raw DHT powders. I would compound a 2.5 or maybe even 5% DHT cream, apply that on my penis before going to bed and make sure that I wear a decent underwear so I don't transfer any of this DHT cream to my wife, which would be highly virilizing, right? So I get the deed done, wash up, apply the cream, wear a little bit tight underwear and keep that in place overnight. And let me make it perfectly clear, I wouldn't do this protocol with a fully functioning HPTA because just like exogenous testosterone cream, exogenous DHT cream would downregulate your HPTA, especially if you apply this directly on the testicles, the scrotum or anywhere close, right? You would inhibit spermatogenesis and testosterone production directly in the testicles and downregulate and shut down your HPTA because now serum testosterone and serum DHT levels would be super physiological. So right now, since I'm just using a test booster, I would not run this experiment. I would not advi advise this experiment. If you're a natural, you're not taking exogenous testosterone, whether that's a testosterone cream or exogenous testosterone administrations intramuscularly, right? I want to get that out of the way so we know what kind of circumstance you can do a protocol like this. Apply the DHT cream, wear some boxers, Take 20 milligrams of Cialis to improve blood flow overnight while multiple erections occur while you're sleeping. And I would either run a growth hormone secretagogue in the form of MK677 because, well, growth hormone at super physiological levels and IGF-1 at super physiological levels, of course, are going to cause a little bit of hyperplasia. So now I have DHT-induced penile growth. I have increased blood flow to the penis overnight and the blood that goes to the penis contains growth hormone and IGF-1, right? It's a complete bro protocol, but if it works, it freaking works, man. And personally, I would love to run this experiment because it's reasonably hands-off. You have to do a couple administrations, certainly a lot less cumbersome and less invasive than those penis pumps or those other devices that people hang from their penises, right? So stay tuned. If I ever get to running such an experiment, I will document it here without before and after pictures, obviously, those are reserved for my wife, right? I'm sorry to disappoint all you closet gays, but some things are not meant to end up in a YouTube channel. I'll inform you if that experiment ever takes place. Now, back to the injectable DHT. Judging by its limited anecdotal reports, but understanding that all of the anecdotal reports have been positive, its limited availability, again, DHT suspension would be available, judging by all the raw providers which I was able to find on the internet. And I would love to run an experiment with injectable dihydrotestosterone enethate in a one-to-one -one ratio with testosterone enethate, take the methanolone enethate out completely, replace that with dihydrotestosterone, let's say 500 milligrams of testosterone enethate and 500 milligrams dihydrotestosterone enethate combined. Don't use an aromatized inhibitor. And then fingers crossed, if I ever get my hands on it, fingers crossed that they get the same phenomenal results as the limited amount of guys that reported their findings about injectable dihydrotestosterone, whether that's enantate or propionate, online. And there's literally a boatload of scientific evidence about dihydrotestosterone that we can pull from. For now, I would say that injectable DHT enantate or propionate is worthy of an experiment, just like injectable stimulon acetate is worthy of an experiment. Again, if you ever get your hands on it, I'll keep you guys in the loop. I'll leave it here, guys. Next on the worth it or not list is going to be the oral 17 alpha alkylated steroids. And then after that, we'll move over to the pro hormones. And you can find everything that I'm associated with down below in the description section. Have a look at the discount codes from the sponsors and affiliates that I'm working with. There's more of that on my website, vigorousteve.com. Consultations are always available. You can find the rates in the consultations section. Follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Vigor Steve. Vigorous crew, you guys know what to do. A front double bicep for you guys. Man, imagine if I rub some DHT cream on these cannons. They would be swole 24-7. Thank you guys so much for watching. 
and I'll see you guys in the next video.